Good morning. It's good to see you this beautiful Lord's Day as we come together to worship our Lord and our Savior because it is tis so sweet to trust Jesus, isn't it? Let's all stand as we sing our call to worship today. Tis so sweet and what a friend. It's good to see you today, and uh, uh, Pastor and Jeff are away today. They're both sick, and we do need to continue praying for them and the Pastor's family. And uh, they are, as far as progress, they're making progress, uh, but it's a slow progress. So uh, just keep lifting them up in your uh, in your prayers, and uh, and we're confident the Lord is going to have them back here before long. And uh, we just pray for their strength, for their healing. It is good to see you each here today, and I'm uh, going to. Uh, at this time, let's, I told Kim she's going to control the, the, the announcements, though. So when I need to move on, she'll hit the next slide. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. Just as a word now, I think, uh, let's see, this week we're not actually having Wednesday at the Grove. We're going to be having the Fall Festival, I believe, this, this Wednesday night. So uh, anyway, that was a reflection on last Wednesday. <laughs> We had a good time up there. It was a wonderful Wednesday up there at the, at the uh, pavilion. But uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll be having, uh, as I say, fall festival. And uh, 
that would be from 5 until 7.30, I believe. Is that right? Is that a, I don't even know. We'll find out. Uh, this is about something I am aware of, and that is the choir. We'd like to invite, <laughs> and invite you to join the choir this year. If you would love to be a part of our Christmas program, we would love to have you and be a part of it. If you're in the middle school or up, you qualify. Okay. So we'd love to have you be a part. Uh, we'll be, it's, it's called Believe uh, the Truth About Christmas. And it's, uh, it's, it, it does tell the gospel story very well and it's, with some beautiful songs and great narration. And uh, it's, it's very concise as to how, how the, what all the Lord did for us in sending his son, uh, Jesus Christ, at Christmas time. So love to have you to be a part. Wednesday nights, 730 for practice. And uh, this is a time for our Mission Georgia uh, offering. And this, these, this particular offering from the Georgia Baptist Mission Board is targeted to five areas. And those areas uh, have much too small a font for me to attempt. <laughs> so I will leave that up to you to do your own research on this one. I think it's in the bulletin as well. So I'd love to have you be part of that. Mission Georgia. And that is the announcement about this Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, October the 27th, 5.30, 5.30 till 8 o'clock. And trunk or treat, and many of you volunteered for that. I think we may still have some opportunities for those. If you'd like to sign up, we have a sign-up sheet in the, uh, the foyer. I'd love for you to do that as well. And I think still some opportunity for candy to come in. The buckets are outside Jeff's uh, office door right here. And uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I speak for the pastors in saying thank you very much for your, your kind words and your cards and the expressions of um, appreciation. We do appreciate that, and uh, thank you very much. It is a blessing to be here and a blessing to, to get to minister together with you. All right, at this time, I do welcome all of you that are visiting today. Uh, we are glad to have you with us. If you would help us to have a record of your visit, there, there are some cards in the in the pews in front of you there. If you would take a visitor's card and fill it out and place it in the slots in the, and as you exit out each side, we have uh, the slots that are relatively new to us. Uh, we've installed since the, uh, the pandemic and uh, put it over there so you can actually place your offering in those slots and, and then also our visitor's cards. You can place those in the slots, they'll be fine. And then we can have a record of your visit. Thank you very much. For, we hope you are blessed as we're blessed by you being here with us today. In just a little while, we're going to have a, a guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Miles Disso uh, is coming from us uh, from Truett McConnell University, and he'll be sharing the message today. He is a professor there, and uh, I, I, I'm just uh, very impressed with I've already been told by another member that to surely mention that you are a tech graduate. <laughs> was that right, Emmett? Is there, every, every, was that, is there, every, oh, <laughs> oh, me. We are we are pleased to have you here. I'm very much blessed. I believe your wife as well. Okay, the the yellow jackets run deep in your home. <laughs> that's great. Surely glad to have you. It's a blessing to us as well, and and to the ministry that's going on over at Truett. It's awesome. It is really great. I'm going to ask that we all join together in prayer, and uh, just ask the Lord's leadership and to speak into our hearts. Heavenly Father, it is a blessing to us to be here in your presence. You said where two or more are gathered in your name, you're right there in the midst. And Lord, we know you're here because of your promise. Father, we just pray that you would just guide us each step of the way. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our heart right now as we proceed, as we continue, that this is a worship time led by you and your Holy Spirit in our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we sing, we sing to you. We offer it as a musical offering to you. Pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing to you. And, Father, as we sing, we also might be a blessing to others. I pray, Lord, that, it, that you would guide us each step of the way. I pray for Dr. Dassault as he brings the, the message today. And I pray, Lord, you would open our ears. We might hear the, the message that you have for each of us, Lord, that we might apply it to our, our hearts and our lives. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
I think they sounded pretty good for 10 people. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It is a blessing. And we do, that is a song of testimony. We got a home waiting for us, and you do too. You are trusting in the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you are. We'd like to join in sharing now a couple of songs. I'd like to ask you to stand with us as we sing Goodness of God and At the Cross.
surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Amen. Let's continue singing about what the Lord, the Lord accomplished for us at the cross. Took care of our sins. seated and invite our children to children's church at this time at preschool through third grade at the cross at the cross the next song sings about that too are you washed in the blood we just sang about it. let's sing have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power are you washed in the Oh, you're gone. 
Give him a, a wonderful welcome, a warm welcome this morning as he comes and brings you. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Mael Disso. I am uh, the dean of the School of Theology and Missions at True McCall University, which basically means that I get to teach what my faculty doesn't want to teach. Uh, I fill the holes, and I take care of all the complaints, and we have a great time. Uh, discipling students and getting them excited about sharing uh, the love of Christ. Uh, if you're picking up on an accent, it's there for a reason. I am French, uh, born and raised in Italy, and in 1991 I came to the States uh, to go to Georgia Tech. So hopefully you won't have too much of an issue with my outrageous French accent this morning. <laughs> uh, but if you, if you do, feel free to raise your hand and say, hey, can you repeat yourself? And I, I sure will. Uh, while at Georgia Tech, I came to Christ, and uh, as I was finishing my doctorate there in aerospace engineering, uh, God changed my direction. And so uh, I graduated, went to Brazil for a week with my wife on a mission trip, and then moved to Southeastern Seminary, where I worked on a master's, and then eventually Southwestern, where I worked on another doctorate, all while teaching engineering. Uh, so I still have those two passions in my heart, uh, but ultimately... Uh, while I love to blow things up and play with lasers, uh, the Word of God is definitely a lot more fun. As we look this morning and as I come here this morning, therefore I bring you the greetings of True McConnell University, but I also bring you the greetings of First Baptist Church in Cleveland, where my wife and I are members. Um, and uh, I thought about starting by asking you uh, who here has been affected by COVID, but I thought I was kind of daft uh, since I'm here because your pastor is at home. Uh, but here's the reality, right? For the last, what, uh, almost two years now, we're getting there. Uh, the world has been affected, uh, some more, some less. Uh, some of you know people who have been very sick. Some of you know people who have uh, died as the process. And no, don't worry, I'm not here to, to, to bring a political sermon on pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, pro-mask, anti -mask. That's not my point. My point is that in this time, I've been saying for quite some time, COVID has shown us what we believe about death. COVID has shown us where our hope is. My wife and I had the pleasure to go see my parents uh, in uh, May. We took a, a quick trip to, to Italy to be able to see them. And uh, just before we left, I had a conversation with uh, one of my mother's acquaintances. Uh, and I made, I made this comment. I said, you know, COVID really has shown us uh, what we believe about death. And she said, and this is a person who was self-described, not church-going, uh, not active in the Roman Catholic Church or anything like that. She says, you're true, you're right. What we're seeing in our society, especially in Italian society in her mind, is the result of a secular society. Because we're reacting as people who don't know God and as people who don't hope in God. Ultimately, our hope is not in a vaccine. Our hope is not in a mask or lack of vaccine or lack of a mask. Our hope is not in a president. Our hope is not in a government. Our hope has to be in Jesus. Amen. And as we think for that, and I was thinking for that, I was thinking about the words of Paul. So we'll be in the book of 1 Thessalonians today uh, with chapter 4. Uh, now hope, 
is throughout the book. And, and throughout the letter that Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, he is focusing on the hope that we have in the coming of Christ. As he ends chapter 1, he tells us, or he tells them, but through the Holy Spirit he tells us, uh, for them themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we have among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then he continues in chapter 2. He tells us uh, that uh, uh, ultimately, as we think through it, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord at his coming? Is it not you? And then in chapter 3, he again brings them to this point. He says, now... May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make your increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And even in chapter 5, as he ends this letter, he tells them, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, the church of Thessalonica knew Christ was returning. Obviously, Paul had taught them that and he reminds them again of that. But in the process, they kind of allowed the world to creep in. And so in chapter 4, the only chapter I didn't read from, Paul reminds them of the hope that we have in Christ, and especially of the hope that we have in his second coming. Now, you, you might ask yourself, why is there here a focus on hope? What was happening in Thessalonica that, that Paul had to remind them of that? Well, as they're waiting for Jesus to return, some of their brothers and sisters in Christ are passing away or dying. And somehow in their mind, they're going, they're going to miss the return of Christ. Somehow in their mind, they're going, maybe, maybe they're not going to experience this glorious moment like we are. And that was bringing sorrow to them. Now, why would they think so? Well, because the world crept in. You see, in a various movement of Greek philosophy, there's no spirit. There's no afterlife, there's no hope in the resurrection. In others, uh, some of the philosophers like Plato would say that the body and the soul are one. And because of that, when the body dies, the soul dies. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at a, an old ancient pagan uh, sarcophagal inscription in Thessalonica, it says this, after death, there is no revival. After the grave, no meaning of those who, have uh, who, who you have loved uh, on earth. Right? They had no hope. The culture told them there is no hope. Death is the end. And Paul says, no, it's not. No, it's not. We have a hope, and our hope uh, is in Christ's coming. And so he tells them in verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brother, concerning those who have fallen asleep. By the way, that's a... A euphemism, right, uh, for dying. Uh, the Greek term here, eventually through, through history, uh, gets translated into Latin, and then into French, and then into the English cemetery. Do you realize that our term for cemetery is really the Greek term for dormitory, a place to sleep? Right? That's what Paul is referring to right here. He says, uh, concerning those who have fallen asleep, let you, uh, lest you sorrow... As others who have no hope. Uh, Paul tells the church in Ephesus that before they came to Christ, uh, they were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so here, as he approaches the Thessalonians, he tells them the second coming of Christ gives us hope in times of sorrow. See, here's the reality. Paul is not telling them not to grieve. Paul is not telling them not to sorrow. Sorrow is a very human emotion. Sorrow is a very human experience. Jesus 
when Lazarus dies, what did he do? He wept, right? Shortest English verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Uh, it's the one that, you know, every young kid wants to memorize. Uh, but, but Jesus wept. Now, we don't know. Uh, theologians have argued whether he wept because of the unbelief or he wept because of the, the loss of a friend or both. But he had sorrow. Jesus in the garden, waiting for his crucifixion, tells his disciples, tonight I am sorrowful. Sorrow is a human emotion that even our Lord experienced here on earth. Sorrow actually can have positive outcome. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians, he says, I'm sorry if my letter made you sorrow, but I'm glad that through that sorrow came growth. And then Peter, as he's writing his letter, uh, tells us that sorrow at times might be necessary. And so when we're faced with times of life, specifically for the Corinthians, with death, but when we're faced with times of life, sorrow is a natural human emotion, but we do not grieve. We do not sorrow like those who have no hope. We sorrow differently. We sorrow with an expectation and a hope that comes from Jesus Christ, that comes from his return. And and that's precisely where Paul goes as he continues. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who fall, who, um, who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of our Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. If you read in in an old King James, it actually reads, will by no means prevent those who are slaves. That's because in 1611, that's what prevent mean. It came from the Latin prevenire, to come before, therefore to proceed. And so here Paul reminds them that the second coming of Christ gives us hope through the gospel. If, it's actually really not if, Right? This conditional sentence here has certainty. Uh, we, we probably should better translate it since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. See, that's the gospel. Uh, for years as a young Christian, I would share my faith and I'd say, hey, Jesus died for your sins. And in time, I became convinced that the gospel is incomplete without the resurrection. Right? Since we believe that Jesus died and rose Again, Paul would tell the believers in Rome, for if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, the hope comes because Christ paid the price. The hope comes because he was sacrificed. Now, I've been speaking enough and for uh, enough years to know that in a crowd this size, there's no doubt somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Uh, Maybe you're here because a friend invited you. Maybe you're here uh, because you're here with family. Or maybe you've been here for quite some time. But as I'm talking about hope, the Spirit of God is making you ask the question, do you have hope? How can I have hope? How can I have hope when the world is so uncertain? How can I have hope when the people I care about are hurting and are dying? How can I have hope when this country is becoming a chaos? How can I hope where even our Southern Baptist Convention is having issues? Well, here's the reality. God created a perfect world. In Genesis 1, we have a a beautiful description of God's creation. It wasn't just good, it was very good, right? And and as God did that, he creates humanity. He creates some who he wants to have a beautiful, loving relationship with. Now, let me ask you, okay? 
if I force you to love me, is that love? No, it's not. And God wanted a, a, a loving relationship with his creation. And so because he did that, he had to give him a choice. Either you follow me and love me, or you reject what I've asked you to do. And Adam and Eve, created perfect, rejected God. And the consequences of that was death, right? He warned them, if you eat of the fruit, you will die. And some might ask, well, but, Mael, don't you know that they don't actually die there? Well, actually, yes, death starts. Right? When we're born, we begin to die. And at that moment when they ate of the fruit, the dying process started in Adam and Eve. And that process gets propagated from generation to generation to generation. The cost of sin is death, a physical, a human death. The sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't do it. They weren't human. And not only that, but as a human dies, he pays the price for his sin. And so God, in his wonderful plan, sends Christ, God incarnate, to walk a perfect life, to live sinless. So that when he dies, he's not paying for his sin. He's paying for our sins. John would say this way, that he is the propitiation, fancy word that basically just says he is the fragrance, aroma, the, 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 the sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the world. Paul reminds us that a propitiation is applied by faith, that if we believe that God raised him from the dead, right? We believe that Christ died and was raised again. We believe in the gospel and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, therefore we repent and we follow him, then we shall be saved. And so maybe that's you this morning. Uh, you're hearing the gospel and God is saying, this is how you find hope. And as he's talking to, as Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he, he is reminding them that the hope that we have is for the gospel and that as God returns, because he will return, right, the Israelites were looking forward to the coming of Christ, we look back at the cross, but we also look forward to his second coming. And as he returned, he will bring with him the saints who have died. All right, Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so the saints who have died, their souls go to be in the presence of the Father. And as Christ returns, he will bring them with him. Thessalonians know the world tells you there is nothing after life, but God says there is. The world tells us today that our hope is in this world, that our hope is in a political system, that our hope is in a medical system, that our hope is in wealth, is our hope is in fame, but no, our hope is in the next life. Our hope is with Jesus. And then he reminds us that we also, who are alive, and by the way, don't miss this. Paul puts himself in the we. Right, Paul doesn't say, you know what? I'm going to go be with Jesus when I die. Paul says, I'm going to be with Jesus when he returns. As a matter of fact, I could make the argument, I don't have the time to do this, that every single writer of Scripture had that same attitude. Their attitude was, no, well, when I die, I'll be with Jesus. But when he returns, I'll be with Jesus. And if he tarries, then I'll be with him when I die. And so we who are left behind, guess what? We also will meet Jesus. And so then he, he, he's, he's like, let me explain this in more detail to you, right? And so not only does the second coming give us hope in times of sorrow, not only does it give us hope for the gospel, but it gives us hope in the resurrection. And so in verse 16, he tells us, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be cut up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Lots of discussion about exactly what's happening here. Right? There's a, there's a shout. This is a shout of command. 
could it be maybe that Jesus is crying out to his angels, go? Or maybe it's like with Lazarus, right? Lazarus, come out. There's a shout of command here. Jesus ends time. He comes and he commands. And then we have the voice of the archangel. Only one other time is is an archangel mentioned in the New Testament, but it's in Jude 9. Uh, He's Michael. Uh, But here it's an archangel, implying that there's more than one. Uh, Daniel actually tells us that because he says Michael is one of the princes. Uh, So we know there's more. We don't know how many. Uh, But we know here, and by the way, we see multiple times in the book of Revelation that the voice of the angels associated with the return of Christ. And then with the trumpet of God. You know, as Jesus prepares his disciples in the Olivet Discourse, uh, he tells them that uh, the angels will be sent uh, at the sound of the trumpet to gather his elect. Uh, We also see that uh, in Revelation 1, Revelation 4, the voice of God is like a trumpet. Uh, And in 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul talks about the resurrection, he tells us, at the last trumpet. So I don't know, I'll admit to you, I don't know, is this one thing? Is this all happening at the same time? Is it a fantastic orchestra? Right? Uh, We don't know what's happening here. We do know it's going to be sonorous. right? It's going to make sound. People will know it's going to happen. It's going to be a triumphant moment when our Lord comes back and the heaven cry out. And as he's coming back, we've seen already that he's bringing the souls of those who have died. But look what happens next. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Right, Their body, their resurrected body will come to life and now in midair their souls and their body will finally be reunited in the presence of Jesus. As I think through this, I, I can't help but think through the words uh, uh, that John writes in Revelation. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is in the fact that we can be in the presence of Christ. Daniel knew this, and as he finishes his book, he tells us, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so the dead will cry first, the dead will rise first, but then we, we who are alive, again, Paul puts himself in that category, we who are alive and remain shall be cut up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. If you look at the text, it's really this beautiful image. It, it, It exudes of the idea of going out to meet a dignitary. Right? Going out to, to accompany and to receive and to welcome the King of Kings. Now, depending on your eschatological view, and again, I'm not here to, 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 to sell one view or another. Uh, this could be us going and meeting with Jesus and then returning to heaven with him uh, to wait and come back later. Or this could be, you know, when your grandparents come for a visit, right? They pull up in the driveway. And you run out, and you meet them at the door, and you hug them, and then you go straight back in the house. Right? It's that perspective. Right? No matter how you see the end of times, we rejoice. And here's the good news. We shall be with the Lord always. This is the beginning of eternity. This is the beginning of rejoicing in a body that doesn't hurt, that doesn't ache, And that doesn't sin. This is the beginning of how life was intended to be when God created us. How our relationship with him was intended to be when God created us. A loving relationship where we follow him and love him and fellowship with him. But isn't it interesting that Paul tells us that this is going to happen in the clouds. Often in scripture we see... Uh, the clouds associated with God in Acts 1-9 as Jesus goes out from the earth. We're told that he goes into the clouds. 
Uh, Psalm uh, 97 talks about the presence of God uh, in the clouds. Mark 9, 7 tells us that the clouds open up, right? And the voice of God resounded on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, here's the most interesting one as I was thinking through this. Ephesians 2, 2 tells us that Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Think about it. Our reunion with Jesus is happening on the enemy's turf. It's almost like he's rubbing it in his face, right? Uh, My people are reuniting with me and have hope because you have no more control over them, Satan. Paul Paul describes this to the church in Corinth in a different way, but so much so uh, the same idea. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we should all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be, ri- will be raised imperishable and will shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the imperishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? Or death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable always, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. As as Paul encourages the church in in, in Thessalonica, again, he reminds them, The second coming of Christ gives us hope in times of sorrow. The second coming of Christ gives us hope through the gospel. The second coming of Christ gives us hope in the resurrection. But also the second coming of Christ gives us hope so we can comfort one another. I don't want you to miss this. This this is just the end. This is a short verse, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a command, by the way. It's not optional. Right? This is an imperative. We are told to comfort one another. But isn't it amazing that Paul doesn't say, therefore, take comfort from these words. Therefore, here, I have comforted you. No, he commands us. Therefore, comfort one another. It's the same thing with the gospel. I've often thought about this. It seems to me, in my limited and obviously wrong way of thinking... Uh, that it would be a lot more successful if Jesus appeared to every single person, right, like he appeared to Paul on the road to, uh, to Damascus, and, and told them, you need to follow me. I mean, it seems like that would be a lot more convincing than me talking to my neighbor. Yeah, that's not God's way of doing things, is it? No. God's way of doing things is using us. Right? He has called us to comfort one another. He has called us to be his hands and his feet. He has called us to proclaim the gospel. He has called us to live in community. So let me ask you a question. Are you the kind that comforts those who are hurting? Are you the kind that goes out and, and wants to encourage them with the word of God? Because that's what you're called to do. If, if you're a follower of Christ today, this is a command. There's no if and buts. This is what your God is asking you to do, to be his hands and his feet. To proclaim the good news of his coming. For some, it's to proclaim it for the first time, that they might find new life in Jesus. And for others, it's just to remind them I have a lot of students that come to my office and uh, they have struggles, they have issues, and I tell them as they come in, I said, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but you need some reminding. Uh, You need to be reminded of who God is. You need to be reminded of your promise to him. You need to be reminded of your faith to him. So let me ask you again. Are you people that are going to comfort each other in these times of struggles? You know, Paul cries out in uh, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die 
is gain. We either meet him in the air as we live for him, or we meet him as we die. But ultimately, a believer, as believers, our hope is in the resurrection. Now, let me, let me add one more comment that's not necessarily in the passage, but I think has to be said. You know, for many years as a young believer, I, I saw people fascinated with eschatology, fascinated with the end times, and my attitude was, I'll find out when it happens. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about the details, and I'm worried about the arguments. When it happens, it happens. I'll discover it then. And then the Spirit of God kind of convicted me and said, Son, it's there for a reason. I didn't just say it uh, just so I could fill the pages of the book. Uh, there's a purpose to it. And so I started looking at passages like this one and others that deal with the end times, not trying to figure out the details, but asking myself the question, why is it there? And you know what I discovered? It's there because it transforms our lives. Think about it. We are the bride of Christ, aren't we? Right? Now, ladies, I'm going to put you on the spot. Any one of you ever imagine showing up at your wedding if you're married, or I've been told you plan your wedding since you're the, the age of five, so the wedding that has not happened yet. Have you ever imagined showing up at your wedding, right, with your mascara running, you're dressed with a big spot right here. Your hair messed up. Any, any takers for that? No takers, right? No. No, you want to show up at your wedding resplendent, right? You want to walk down the aisle so the, the gentleman that's standing in front goes, I can't believe I get to marry her today. Is that our attitude when our bridegroom comes? Right? Is that our attitude when Jesus returns? Because that should be. Right? The, the reason we are reminded that Christ returns is so that we can prepare for his return. Right? So we can be prepared. Uh, John would write as beloved, we are God's children, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Right, the hope that we get from the resurrection should also be transformative. It should make us ready. It should give us a desire to await his return and be ready for it. But it also should give us a desire to make sure our friends and our neighbors and the people down the street and the waiter at the restaurant and the cashier at the store are ready for it. Because most likely, they have no hope. They are the ones who grieve without hope. And so as we prepare for his coming, as we draw hope from his return, let me encourage you, prepare yourself for his return and share the message of hope with your neighbors. Share the message of hope with your friends. Share the message of hope with your family members so that when he returns, they'll be part of this beautiful reunion. They'll be part of this wonderful experience that Paul shares with us here. So church, where do we get our hope? We get our hope in Jesus. Where do we get our hope in times of sorrow? We get our hope in the fact that he is coming back and that we who are left behind will be with him. We who are left behind will meet him in the air. We who are left behind will spend eternity with him. So now let's go, let's go and share that hope with the people that are around us. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. It's a simple message that you have for us, Father. Our hope is in the resurrection. I pray that that would be true for us today. I pray that our life will show that. Father, I pray that we would proclaim and declare that. Yes, this world has uh, given us all sorts of things that are, are troubling. 
But Father, we don't find our hope in this world. We find our hope in you. And so we ask as we go to a time of invitation that you work in our hearts, that you convict us of what we need to do. And Father, that we would walk out of here hopeful and wanting to declare that hope. As in Christ, let me pray. Amen. Well, my visitor's here, and I don't know how you do invitation, but this is how we're going to do it today. <laughs> For some of you, as you hear this message, you've realized you don't have hope. You realize that that hope is only through Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you to come, whether you talk to me, whether you talk to your pastor, whether you talk to the person in the pew next to you. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you can finally receive hope. Won't you meet Jesus? Won't you come to him today? For some of you, you realize that in your life, you've allowed the world to control you. You've allowed the world to, to cloud your judgment. You've lost the vision and the hope of having Christ. And today is a day to call to your Lord and say, renew the joy of my salvation. Renew the hope that I have in Christ. Whether you do it in your seat, whether you come down here and pray, spend some time with the Lord and ask him to re-energize your faith, uh, and your hope in Him. And maybe some of you, as, as we were talking about the fact that God has called you to encourage one another, God has called you to uh, proclaim His message, you've been struggling, you've been struggling for a while to be obedient to God, to be obedient to His calling, to be obedient to do what God has called you to do. You know, I see a lot of saints of God that have been on this planet for many years, and here's what I want to tell you. If God was done with you, you'd be in his presence right now. The reason that you're still here is that he is not done. And it could be just living out your life, or for some of you it could be taking that step of faith and serving him in a different way, in a more involved way. I don't know what God is telling you today, but whatever he's do, do it. You will never regret it. This is a song of prayer. Have thine own way, Lord. And you respond as the Lord leads. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the Hold me and make me. 
Lord's bless you today. Just say amen. 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 And Dr. Disso, thank you so much for being here with us today. It was a joy uh, to have you open up the word for us. And uh, God bless you and your ministry at Truett. And uh, we are excited about the things we hear going on there. That is a, it's an awesome place.